Are you looking to be changed? I mean really changed. The Bible states that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, the hymn verse says. That wandering from God's best is innately part of our fallen nature. The reason? We all have the same blood type. Blood type A. It stands for Adam. And every person born in this world has been contaminated with Adam's sin. But we're not left hopeless, for Scripture declares that one day we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. That glorious day is the subject of Pastor Mark Byer's current series entitled The Second Coming Reexamined. So grab a notebook and pen and follow along. I want to point out what Jesus says. He says, how many are going to fail to stand to the end? Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Do you know what the NIV says? Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. The New American Standard, and because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. One of the signs of the end is there's going to be a significant falling away. And that has not taken place. Oh, we are getting set up for it. With the seeker-friendly churches and all the, the sloppy agape and everybody saved. And you just have to accept Jesus. And the churches are growing by leaps and bounds with no sense of the cost of discipleship. When all of a sudden men are being betrayed, we are hated by all nations for his namesake. You can be sure there's going to be a great falling away. Paul mentions it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, and he uses the word apostasia, which means defection, a forsaking, or a falling away. Disasters in the world, deserters in the church, and a dictator in the Middle East. This is the one everybody wants to talk about. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place... Whoever reads, let him understand. Now we're getting down to the specifics. These other two are a gradual beginning of sorrows that begin to escalate until he comes to this point. The abomination of desolation spoken of Daniel. And then he says, let all those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. I'll show you some scriptures briefly in a few moments that mountains speak of nations. If the Antichrist is a worldwide government, just what nations and mountains are we going to flee to if he's ruling everywhere and every place? And where are these Christians going to flee from? And it is not Detroit they're told to flee from. He says, let those who are in Judea. To say that this is a worldwide fleeing is foolishness. This is specifically Judea. It applied to the early days, which we will mention shortly from the life of Josephus. But the clear fact is, there is coming a day where there will be an end-time abomination of desolation. Daniel said it was an end-time event. Jesus refers to it as being in 70 AD and the end. And clearly, Daniel says the abomination of desolation is at the end of the age. So Jesus refers to it, and he says, when that happens, let everyone in Judea flee. The Antichrist kingdom is going to be centered in Judea and Jerusalem. Let him who's on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babes in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then shall be great tribulation, such as has not been, listen to this, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. Whatever he's talking about happening in Judea and Jerusalem area is going to be so bad, it's worse than anything that has ever happened in the history of the world, and it is so bad, it'll never happen again. Does that sound like 70 AD could fit that bill? Not hardly. We'll look at that. He says, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And of course... Popular theology calls the elect their Jews. There is only one elect in the whole Bible. Men of faith, believing in the Messiah. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, don't believe it. 
For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. It doesn't say in the Greek, if it were, as the King James. It says, if there's anything in you that's possible to be deceived, it will be. It will be. It's kind of like giving the thief the offering to count. If there is a thieving heart, he'll rob the offering. If there is a deceitful, rebellious, self-willed, stiff-necked heart in us, when the Antichrist is moving in the earth and these days are upon us, if there is anything in us that is open to being deceived, it will be deceived. See, he says, I have told you beforehand. Why tell us if we're not even going to be here? Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. And the reason why, for as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered. By the way, the second coming of Christ is culminated by the battle of Armageddon. Is that true? How many of you know that's true? He comes, battle of Armageddon. How many of you know that in the battle of Armageddon, the angels call the birds of the field to come and feast on the bodies of the dead captains and generals and so forth? There's this horrible massacre in the valley of Jezreel, which is at the base of Mount Megiddo, which gives us the name Armageddon. And this is the very spot Elijah slew the false prophets of Baal. The very place is where this is going to take place. And when this takes place, according to Revelation, there is a massacre of bodies. And the birds of the fields, the vultures come, and the Bible says they devour those bodies and clean up the mess. Jesus says, don't be deceived. You will know that my second coming has taken place, because where the carcasses are, the eagles will be gathered. You know how we're going to know the second coming has taken place? There will be a massive massacre in the valley of Jezreel and the vultures will be eating the bodies of the dead soldiers. That's why he throws this in here. That's what Armageddon's all about. Read it. It's in the book of Revelation. It fits perfectly. He comes, Armageddon takes place, and there's the feast. There's two feasts going on. It's interesting. There's the feast of the marriage supper and the feast of the vultures all taking place at the same time. What does he say? Let those that are in the mountains flee to Judea. You know what Isaiah 2, 2 says? Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Clearly mountains speak of nations. In Isaiah 41, 11 to 15, he says to Israel, and those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing as a non-existent thing. Behold, I will make you into a new threshing sledge with sharp teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and beat them small and make the hills like chaff. Clearly, mountains and nations are used synonymously in the prophetic scriptures. Under the dominion of Antichrist, the Lord says, those who are in Judea flee. They are to flee to the nations that are not under his control. I'm going to give you probably 15 biblical reasons in the book of Revelation why the Antichrist kingdom is not worldwide. With world catastrophic events happening as a result, yes, but not worldwide. His government will not be worldwide. In this short three and a half year period, the troubles in the earth are going to reach a pinnacle and come to the worst time in the history of the world. As I said to you, those of you that believe in a seven-year tribulation, please give me a slip of paper with two verses proving that. I'd be very interested in seeing your two verses. The reason I say that with such confidence, hopefully I don't come across as cocky, I just come across confident. The reason I say that is I don't believe you can give me two verses that prove a seven-year tribulation, because I've never found them in the whole time that I've been searching in the Bible. And when somebody confronted me with that, I immediately thought, how oh, crazy, I'll show them. And then after I began searching, I decided, you know what, they're right. One of those humbling experiences about 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I realized the tribulation isn't even seven years long. It's just what the book of Revelation says it is, 42 months. This big trouble, this big tribulation, this great tribulation, 
Revelation 7, 14 says that John saw this company of people and he asked them who they were. And he said, sir, you know. He said, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus talks more about this sign than all the rest. I'm going to talk the most about this abomination of desolation and this Antichrist kingdom more than the rest as well. You can read about the abomination of desolation in Daniel 9, 27, Daniel 11, 31, and Daniel 12, 11. Daniel was prophesying about this king coming into Jerusalem who was going to blaspheme God. He was going to defile the temple. He was going to viciously persecute the people of God. As we've already mentioned, there was a man named Antiochus Epiphanes, a Syrian king, who came in in 170 BC, and he did all of those things. His name was Epiphanes, which means glorious, but one historian writes that behind his back, he was called Epimenes, which means crazy. Daniel said that he would rule for 2,300 days. He came into the city of Jerusalem, and he set up the abomination, which was idols of Zeus, and he stopped the daily prayer and sacrifice in the temple. And the Lord tells us that that was going to last for 1,290 days in the book of Daniel. It's interesting, 1,290 days is literally 13 days longer than three and a half years. 1,290 days is exactly 13 days longer than three and a half years. During Antiochus' three and a half year persecution of Jerusalem, he made the Jews abandon the law. He demanded that they renounce Christ. You can read about this in the book of Maccabees in the Apocrypha. Their worship was, an altar was set up to Zeus. He offered pigs on it. And he filled the rooms of the offices of the priests with temple prostitutes. This man was a vile, wicked man. He died insane. And he was overthrown by the family in Israel called the Maccabees. And he ended his reign of terror. And Israel regained control of their country. In Daniel chapter 11 and 12. In verses 35 in chapter 11. And in Daniel 12, 9 through 11. It is very clear that this event will be at the time of the end. That's extremely important. This event will be at the time of the end. So Antiochus Epiphanes could not be the fulfillment. He could only be a foreshadowing of the fulfillment because the Bible says the event will take place at the time of the end. Incidentally, I would like you to turn to book of Daniel chapter 12. I want to show you a very important fact. This will help you in your future study of the word of God. How many of you are aware that the popular teaching in the United States demands that the Antichrist come and he builds a temple and then three and a half years into his supposed covenant that he's made with Israel, he violates that covenant and he offers a pig in the temple that he built. And the reason is, as it says that from that time, the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up in Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. I would like you to notice that the word, the daily sacrifice, the word sacrifice is not in the original language. The word sacrifice is in italics. The word sacrifice is not there. It has been added by translators. What that scripture is actually saying, and from the time that the daily is taken away and the abomination of desolation set up, there shall be 1,290 days. How many of you have seen pictures of Israel in the Western Wall with the Jews praying at that wall? You know, they've got their hats on, they're praying. I've been there, I've prayed at that wall, and quite frankly, I had a real meeting with the Lord at that wall as I prayed and asked God, I read what the scripture says about praying toward that temple. And as I read what the word of God said, I became acutely aware that God has given tremendous promises to those who pray at that wall. And when I realized that, I went to that wall and I was weeping and praying and meeting God. The Jews are going to be forbidden to offer their daily prayer at that wall. There is no need for a temple to ever be built because it's not talking about a daily sacrifice it is talking about the daily, 
And every Jew in the world who is a practicing Jew realizes that the daily means the daily prayer time. And I've been on airplanes flying across to Israel with many of the Jewish people there. And when sunrise would come up, they would get out in the middle of the aisles. They would open their prayer books. They would put on their prayer shawl. And they would begin praying right on the airplane, right out loud, totally unashamed of what they do. And I realized, no wonder the world hates them. They constantly remind them that there's a God in heaven. And they don't like to retain God in their knowledge. There's some very interesting similarities between what happened with Antiochus Epiphanes in the last days. It's for approximately the same number of days. One is 1260, 30 days shorter than Antiochus. And the Bible tells us in Revelation 12 and 13 that the tribulation period lasts for 1260 days, 42 months. They both are going to take place in Jerusalem and Judea. And we're all told anybody that's there that loves the Lord to get out. They aren't even to a pack. Turn with me to Luke 21 for a moment. We're getting into the meat of this Antichrist teaching. Remember, Luke centers on 70 AD more than he does the end. And he says in chapter 21, verses 20 to 22, when you see Jerusalem, now listen to this, listen to this carefully and think about what's being said. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then, when? When you see Jerusalem surrounded. Then, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let not those who are in the country enter her, enter Jerusalem. Those who are in the midst of Jerusalem, get out of there and don't go into her. If you're out in the country. And these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Jesus says, when you see Jerusalem, listen, surrounded, flee for your life. If I was a German in World War II and I was in Stalingrad, I would be wondering how you flee when you're surrounded. The whole purpose of surrounding a city is to eliminate the exodus of its citizens. And the Lord says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded, get out. Well, whatever happened, one thing we know, of the over one million Jews that were killed that time in 70 AD, no Christians died. Josephus clearly states that. He was an eyewitness of this event. He was literally in the camp of the Romans with Titus. Josephus himself became a Christian. Josephus was protected. He was not part of the destruction. But he records in detail what happened. He says, when you see it surrounded, Jesus says, when you see it surrounded, get out. The Christians obviously knew something that we don't know. But Josephus records something very interesting on page 1744 of his book. Listen to this. By the way, this excited me because it showed the heart of God. One thing I want to assure you about in the end, God wants you to make it. God wants us all to make it. He wants us all to be ready. He wants us all to be aware of what's happening so we're not deceived. His heart is toward you. He's not looking for a reason to get rid of you. He's not looking for a reason to trick you. He's not looking for some secret things to hide from you so you aren't ready. He will do everything in his power in the last days to make sure all of us are clearly ready if we are willing to listen to what he says. And when I read what Josephus wrote, I was thrilled because even after Jesus was removed from the scene, even when the disciples had all fled the city, I want you to read what Josephus writes. A certain prodigious and incredible phenomenon appeared. I suppose the account of it would seem to be a fable were it not related by those that saw it, and were not the events that followed it of so considerable a nature as to deserve such signals. For, before sunsetting, chariots and troops of soldiers in their armor were seen running about among the clouds and surrounding the city. Speaking of Jerusalem. Moreover, at the feast, that feast which we call Pentecost, as the priests were going by night into the inner court of the temple, as their custom was, 
to perform their sacred ministrations, they said that in the first place they felt a quaking and heard a great noise. And after that they heard a noise as of a great multitude saying, Let us remove hence. But what is more terrible, there was one man named Jesus, the son of Ananus, a plebeian and a husbandman, who four years before the war began, and at the time when the city was in great peace and prosperity, came to that feast wherein it is our custom for everyone to make tabernacles to God in the temple, began on a sudden to cry aloud, A voice from the east! A voice from the west! A voice from the four winds! A voice against Jerusalem and the holy house! A voice against the bridegrooms and the brides! And a voice against this whole people! This was his cry as he went about day and by night in all the lanes of the city. However, certain of the most eminent among the populace had great indignation at this dire cry of his and took up the man and gave him a great number of severe stripes. Yet did not he either say anything for himself or if anything peculiar to those that chastised him, but still went on with the same words which he cried before. Whereupon our rulers supposing, as the case proved to be, that this was a sort of divine fury in the man, he noticed that it was a divine fury in the man after the case was fulfilled, they brought him to the Roman procurator, where he was whipped till his bones were laid bare. Yet he did not make any supplication for himself, nor shed any tears, but turning his voice to the most lamentable tone possible, at every stroke of the whip, his answer was, Whoa! Whoa to Jerusalem. And when Albinus, for he was then our procurator, asked him who he was and whence he came and why he uttered such words, he made no manner of reply to what he said, but still did not leave off his melancholy ditty till Albinus took him to be a madman and dismissed him. Now during all the time that passed before the war began, this man did not go near any of the citizens, nor was seen by them while he, he said so, but he every day uttered these lamentable words as if it were his premeditated vow. Woe! Woe to Jerusalem! Nor did he give ill words to any of those that beat him every day, nor good words to those that gave him food. But this was his reply to all men, and indeed no other than a melancholy presage of what was to come. This cry of his was the loudest at the festivals, and he continued this ditty for seven years and five months without growing horse or being tired therewith until the very time that he saw his presage in earnest fulfilled in our siege when it ceased. For as he was going around upon the wall, he cried out with the utmost force, Woe! Woe to the city again and to the people and to the holy house! And just as he added at the last, And woe! Woe to myself also! There came a stone out of one of the engines it smote him and killed him immediately, and he was uttering the same presages as he gave up the ghost. An eyewitness wrote that. Seven years they were being told, get out, get out, get out. Woe to Jerusalem. This madman was beaten, beaten till his bones were laid bare, and he was taken all the way to the procurator of Rome. Everyone knew about him. They hated him. The leaders hated him. And Josephus says that his report came to pass. He says that there was horses and chariots seen in heavenly places, in soldiers in armor circling the city in the clouds by many witnesses. Even the priests, when they went into the temple, they were told to leave the city, remove from hence. The only ones who recognized that this was about to be the Holocaust of Holocausts for Israel were those who had heard the words of Jesus and believed them. They removed from that city. They got out. And when that city was completely destroyed, there was not one Christian who died.
On behalf of Pastor Mark Byers and Kingdom Living, thank you for joining us for today's broadcast. God has one overarching goal in mind prior to Christ's return, and that is to redeem us from all moral and spiritual impurity. Listen to Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. He intends to return for a glorious church. Let's join Pastor Mark and learn more about this blessed hope as he continues his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. The problem with saying that the prophecy of Matthew 24 was fulfilled in 70 AD is that this says that nothing like this will have ever happened since the beginning of the world, nor ever shall be. One million Jews died in 70 AD. Six million died in World War II. Stalin murdered 30 million Russians and Mao 30 million Chinese. It is very clear in this generation that what happened in 70 AD has happened much worse since. And let me say this about Titus. Titus was no vicious man. He was fulfilling his command to attack the city. Most people don't realize this. He did everything to save the city from destruction. He commanded his soldiers, do not destroy the temple. And let me read something that Josephus writes about Titus on page 1702 in his book. Now the seditious, that's the ones who were inside the city. Inside the city there were zealots fighting one another, killing one another. They were even doing this. They were burning down houses filled with food to stop the opposing zealot group to get the food. They're starving in the city and they're burning houses filled with food. Now the seditious, speaking of dead bodies, had them cast down from the walls into the valleys beneath. However, when Titus, in going his rounds along those valleys, saw them full of dead bodies and the thick putrefaction running about them, listen to what Titus does. This is the Antiochus. This is the Antichrist. This is the terrible, vicious, abominable man. He gave a groan and spreading out his hands to heaven, called God to witness that this was not his doing. And such was the sad case of the city itself. However, when the seditious still showed no inclination of yielding, Titus, out of his compassion of the people that remained, and out of his earnest desire to rescue what was still left of these miseries, began to raise the attack banks again. Although materials for them were hard to come at, from all the trees that were about the city had been already cut down from making the former banks. Titus said, what's going on inside that city is so horrible. It is so bad. We've got to get in there and we've got to stop it. Titus did not go into the city of Jerusalem with the intention of massacring the Jews. He went in there to deliver them. By the time he did, there was none left that wanted delivered. Jesus says there's going to be another terrible abomination of desolation in Jerusalem. The reason why they are to pray and we are to pray that the flight be not on the Sabbath is really quite clear if you've been to Jerusalem. All public transportation is shut down because it's the Sabbath. If it's in the winter, they're going to have to flee and stay outside. Some years ago, I was doing some research on survival and during the Y2K time, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't bullheaded and just ignored the possibilities of, of dangers. So I read up on some things, and I realized that there are three things you need and I need to survive. What are they? Food, water, 
Shelter. Let me ask you, what's the most important? That's what I would have said. You can't live more than about three, four days without water. You can live 30, 40 days without food. I've done that once already. But you know something? You can freeze to death in 60 degree weather. Did you know that? Being a hunter, camper, hypothermia is when you get wet. And if it's 60 degrees, your body heat begins to just evaporate. And when you get below 85 degrees body temperature, you pass out. As it continues to drop, you just simply go to sleep and don't wake up again. The most important single preservation thing you need in a time of catastrophe is shelter. Jesus said, pray that it's not in the winter. Why? Because he just got through saying to them, if you see it, don't even go into the house to get your cloak. Get out of the city as fast as you can. There would be no provisions and they would be exposed to the elements and two or three hours exposed to winter elements in 50 to 60 degree weather with moisture and you're a dead man. That's why if you fall into a river or a lake this time of year, you're going to die. The water is now dropping too cold for you to live very long in water. It's a miracle if you don't die in the water today. And he's saying, pray that it's not in winter because you're not going to have the opportunity to go back and get anything for shelter. Pregnant women and nursing mothers, how are they going to flee for their lives when they've got little ones? Dear ones, this Antichrist, which incidentally, I don't know if you're aware of this, John is the only person who calls him Antichrist. And he only calls him that in the book of 1 John. He never calls him that in the book of Revelation. The name Antichrist doesn't even appear in the book of Revelation. It's amazing how everybody sees the Antichrist in that book and he doesn't even appear as far as his name goes. And incidentally, another thing that's important to know about Antichrist, that is his name, that's the most popular name. It is a name for him, along with the man of sin, the man of lawlessness, and so forth, that Paul refers to in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3-12. This lawless one who's going to deceive and so forth. The word anti in the Greek does not mean against. It means instead of or in place of. It refers to a substitute or a counterfeit. Even though Antichrist is never mentioned in the book of Revelation or Daniel, John refers to him by that name and it's the most popular name given to him. The book of Revelation gives specific details about this man in chapters 13 to 19. He's going to be so blasphemous, he's going to try to throw God out of his own temple. And that temple, I do not believe, is one built on Mount Moriah in Israel. The New Testament temple is us. And by the way, I am personally 100% convinced of this. He is already sitting in the temple of God and is being worshipped as though he were God in God's temple through rock music right now. All over the church today, there have been those worshiping with his music to him, thinking that they were worshiping God, and it's not God at all. And the fruit of their worship is immoral, rebellious young people. Back to Revelation 17. Chapter 13 to 19 is full of teaching, and I would like you to read this week, chapter 13 through 17 of Revelation at least. You can also read the book of Daniel, chapter 8 through 12. It will also give you some insight. But in chapter 17, starting in verse 7, I want to point out a couple things before I close. This Antichrist is going to be assisted by a man called the false prophet. But starting in verse 7 of chapter 17, it says, And the angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman, that's the Babylon, and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. Seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sets. So we have seven heads representing seven governments. 
upon which this woman, the harlot of Babylon, sat. There are also seven kings. Now listen. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. I don't know what you've heard about that. But people wrestle over that, trying to figure out which Roman Caesar this is referring to. And the reason they never come up with a sure answer is because I don't believe it's referring to a Roman Caesar at all. I'll explain to you in just a minute who I believe this is. And the beast that was and is not is himself also the eight and is of the seven. Boy, this sounds like a bunch of double talk, doesn't it? And is going to perdition. The ten horns which you saw, this we are left without any exception, are ten kings. Now listen to what it says. Who have received no kingdom as yet. But they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind. And they will give their power and authority to the beast. Last week I mentioned to you that the area that Daniel describes that will be the Antichrist kingdom is the area conquered by one man he talks about in detail. And that man was Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great, make note of this, never went into Europe ever except one little corner of Greece. He never conquered Europe. He never went into Europe. He never even attempted to attack Europe. He attacked all of what is known now as the Islamic nations. He went all the way over through India and conquered all the way down into Egypt and all the way over all of the Holy Land area and all of the nations around there. Iraq, Iran, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Israel. He attacked and conquered all of them. Now John says the angel told him that these seven heads are seven mountains or seven kingdoms. Now listen real carefully. I just want to give you what I believe to be the truth about these seven heads and ten kings. Alexander the Great's kingdom has been ruled over in the history of the world by seven different governmental heads. Everybody gets confused with this because they're looking to Rome. The problem is, I don't believe it's talking about Rome. I think time is going to prove my opinion right. It says that there are seven heads, which are seven mountains or seven kingdoms. And that area of Alexander the Great, which Daniel says is unquestionably the area ruled by the Antichrist, has already been ruled by six different nations and is presently being ruled by one other. The historical fact is that area has been ruled by Egypt. It has been ruled by Assyria. It has been ruled by Babylon. It has been ruled by the Medes and the Persians. It has been ruled by the Greeks under Alexander the Great. And it was ruled by the Romans. That is six nations. Six kingdoms. Six heads. And he says the seventh hasn't yet come. Of course, it didn't come until Muhammad came along and instituted the nation of Islam. And today, it is now controlled by one nation, and it is called the nation of Islam. This area of that kingdom has had seven governmental heads, the last of which is presently in existence, and it is the nation of Islam. It has ten heads, and the Bible says that the ten heads are ten kings. Therefore, the kingdom of Antichrist is not a worldwide government. It is a Middle Eastern government with ten countries, ten kings, ruling over the area that has been ruled by seven different nations and seven different governments and seven different political authorities, starting with Egypt right down through to the nation of Islam. There are ten kings that are going to rule and be part. And I want you to notice that it says, these kings 
are going to be given power or receive authority for one hour. It is very clear that the beast is one of the seven and becomes the eighth. He's one of the seven governments and he establishes the eighth. What does the angel mean? The kings will only reign for one hour. Stop and think of that for a minute. They shall receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. Now let me ask you a logical question. Do you think that if kings were giving rulership for one literal hour, they would even warrant being mentioned in the book of Revelation? One hour. What does that mean? They will be given a kingdom and authority for one hour. How many of you remember what I taught just a few weeks ago that the Lord says, with the Lord, a day is as a thousand years and one thousand years is as a day. Isn't that true? And he says this in the book of Peter. Know this one thing. Now that's quite a statement. When talking about the end, Peter says, know this one thing. A thousand years is as a day and a day is as a thousand years. Well, let me show you a little bit of math. If the angel is speaking of a day being 1,000 years, you understand what I'm saying? A day has 24 hours. Is that correct? Therefore, if you divide 1,000 years by one hour, 24 hours, what you have is 41 years and 8 months. Has there ever been a time in history where 10 nations were birthed all relatively within the same amount of time and have existed for approximately 40 years? How many of you are aware that before World War I, there was no Jordan, there was no Lebanon, there was no Syria, there was no Iraq, there was no Iran, there was no Israel, there was no Saudi Arabia. Are you aware of that? And what happened is, that was all controlled by the United Kingdom, and after World War II, it was decided they would be given their independence, and around 1950, there were nation after nation after nation after nation born in the earth that have literally existed for just over 40 years right now. And the Bible says these kings will be given authority for one hour. And they were all given their authority all at one time. And they were all given authority and they are ruling under the influence of the nation of Islam. Daniel says that he saw this image and we know that the head spoke of Babylon, the chest spoke of the Medes and the Persians, the hips spoke of the Greeks, the loins and legs spoke of the Romans. And then he saw the feet. And he saw this kingdom that had ten toes and it was the feet of this beast. This beast was an evil spirit that has been functioning in the history of the world since Babel. That's why the head is called Babylon. It was ruling over Egypt. It was ruling over Assyria. The same spirit ruled over Babylon, Assyria, Medes and Persians, the Greeks and the Romans. This spirit has been the controlling spirit of that area of the world. But his last kingdom, Daniel says, has ten toes on his feet. And here's an interesting phrase, and you can read this in Daniel. It says that the kingdom is different than all the rest. And the reason it's different is it's partly mixed and partly divided. The nation of Islam is a group of nations that are united differently than any other national organization. It is different than any nation that has ever existed. It is partly mixed and partly divided. They hate one another as much as they almost hate anyone else. Iran and Iraq fought a huge civil war, murdering millions of their own young people for years, like eight or nine years just recently. 
fighting one another. They are partly mixed and partly divided. And it is the nation of Islam. The feet of the image of Daniel is not Rome. Get your eyes off of Rome. Forget about Europe. Forget about Rome. Look at what's happening in front of our very eyes. The nation of Islam with ten kings and ten toes and ten partly mixed nations and partly divided nations ruling over that very area that God said would be the area are now aggressive in causing peace to be taken from the earth. And everybody in the church is looking at Rome because of Mr. Schofield and Mr. Darby. The spirit of that beast who was and is not and is, Mr. Muhammad started this organization. And at one point during the Crusades, he was almost, his whole, whole organization, spiritual organization, was almost annihilated. And then all of a sudden, he began to rise again. The Islamic nations tried to conquer the world in the Middle Ages. And it was through the Crusades they were driven back. And now, they are moving forward again. They were, they were not, and now they are. And that beast riding on that mountain in that area that was Alexander the Great's kingdom has gathered himself kings. And they will be given authority for one hour. And at the end of that one hour, the king of kings and the lord of lords is going to meet them in the valley of Jezreel and massacre that group of people and set up his kingdom in Jerusalem and there will no more be debate who rules Jerusalem because King Jesus will be in residence there. Amen. I hope I have stirred you to at least read the book of Daniel and read the book of Revelation again. Because I am convinced, dear ones, we are facing that kingdom. And right now we are already in war with that kingdom. We are facing the worst days. And the terrorists of Islam are going to make sure they're the worst days we've ever known. Those who were in the World Trade Center and died or survived, burned over all their bodies, already have faced the worst days they've ever faced. We need to be aware. We are facing a demonic force who is under the inspiration of the satanic kingdom, who knows his time is short, and he's going to go about like a roaring lion trying to bring the countries of the world under his authority. He'll never do it, but he will have ten kingdoms. And they will tear up the world, trample it, and cause peace to be completely removed from the entire earth as it already is happening. Let's stand. Father, in the name of Jesus, my heart burns within me with this message. And I'm asking you to take it and burn it into the hearts of the hearers. My heart groans within me, realizing the lack of preparation in all of us. And I realize that we are facing some of the darkest days in the history of the world. The darkest days, which you said have never been before or ever will be after. It is not time to play games, but it is time to seek the Lord while he may be found. It's time to call upon you while you are near. It's time for us to turn from our wicked ways cease from sin cast aside the frivolities of this society and get serious about the coming of the Lord I pray that you will take this message and make it like a threshing instrument in your people's lives and I pray you'll do it in Jesus name Amen Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Just what comforting words was Paul referring to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Well, just listen. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He encouraged them to rehearse this event in their minds so as not to be disheartened and fall away under the trials of everyday life. Let's also gain comfort as Pastor Mark Byers expounds more on this triumphal event in his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. Last week I gave you a parallel comparison of Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, which are the three main records of the main discourse of Jesus, the, what is called the Olivet Discourse on the Second Coming of Christ. In those three books, all three of these, the, what they call the Synoptic Gospels, the similar Gospels who have a similar message, they all record the words of Jesus in response to the question that the disciples asked. When Jesus had told them the temple would be destroyed, they said, When shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the age? the end of the world. And Jesus answered them. And that's the section of this series that we're looking at is his answer in Matthew 24, which we're centering in Matthew 24 because it is the largest of the discourses concerning the end. And I want everyone to have one of these handouts, but I would appreciate if you wouldn't look at the handouts until we get to that material. I want to go over this material in the sermon, so please don't read it and then undo half the message. I'm giving it to you because I want you to know where I'm finding the statements that I'm making. I want you to understand why I make them. I want you to understand that my only goal is to be biblically sound, and I'm willing to be considered off the wall to be biblically sound. I realize that there's a lot of things going on in the church about the end times, quite frankly, that are foolishness. I don't want to be cruel or unkind, but the concepts that are being promoted so popularly have so little biblical foundation that I am amazed. My one brother, who some of you have met and know, is an author, and he wrote a book on the end times that is quite thorough. And when he wrote it, he gave a copy of that book, the manuscript, to a Bible student, a scholar of the Word of God, a member of a, a pastor, leader, who in his particular denomination, as is the case in many, quite frankly, they don't almost even mention the end times. They don't talk about it. They don't preach about it. So it was very, very foreign to him. It wasn't something he was deeply involved in or understood or even had studied, not in his seminary or anywhere. And he gave this book to the man because he felt like he would be very critical and have a sharp eye because the man was very learned in the scripture, but he was not really concentrating his training on end times, which is very common among some of the more mainline denominations, this man read the book. He came to him after he had read the book. And as I gave to you the, the seven inferences that build the case for a pre-tribulation rapture, and the verses that I gave you some weeks ago now, the man came to him and he said, you know, I think it's a little unfair of what you've done. My brother said, what do you mean? He said, well, he said, whenever politicians and so forth attack their opponent, he said, they pick the weakest things they've ever said or the weakest points of their whole argument, and they make that the most powerful part of their whole argument, and they attack that and try to undermine their position by making the weakest parts of their argument look like the most powerful in the eyes of the people they're trying to convince. And he says, and that's what you've clearly done in this book. My brother said, what do you mean? He said, well, the arguments that you've presented for a pre-tribulation rapture are so incredibly weak. It wasn't kind or fair of you to undermine the position by using those arguments. My brother turned to him and said, you don't understand. They are the most powerful arguments of a pre-tribulation position that are presented. He said, it can't be. It's impossible. He said, I'm telling you. I have, he, and he mentioned to him, he said, I have taught in times in seminars in countries all over the world, and I have taught them to ministers by the thousands. 35,000 ministers have attended the seminars concerning in times that he has taught. And he said, 
At the end of each seminar, I will open up the floor to those who want to discuss openly any of the weaknesses they feel I have in my argument. And the arguments that he presented in his book, which incidentally I've presented in our teaching, they're not because they're from his book. I didn't even read his book for the preparation of those arguments. It was just, all you got to do is open the Bible and read the arguments and what the context is of them. And he said, every time after I'm done, the main arguments that will be put forth to undermine the position that I have put out are these, and the top four are the ones that I've listed. And the man said, it is incredible to me that anybody could possibly believe a pre-tribulation rapture doctrine if that is the main arguments. And I assure you, what he had presented in his book were the main arguments of the pre-tribulation rapture position. For those of you that are visiting this morning, I don't want to blow you away. I do not believe there is even a shred of scriptural evidence to base the fact that the church is going to be raptured out of the tribulation. We will look at some of those scriptures today, but that's not the emphasis of today's message. That was the emphasis some weeks ago. And one of the things that I have said to people to just shake them enough to wake them up, and this is what shook me up and woke me up, is this. I ask everyone in this room, I challenge you to give me two verses in the whole Bible that prove the tribulation lasts for seven years. All I ask is for two. And the reason I ask for two is the fact that in the mouth of two witnesses, everything should be established. And secondly, I ask for two because everybody jumps right away to Daniel chapter 9 and says the 70th week of Daniel. But when you study the 70th week of Daniel through un- jaded eyes who have not been pre-programmed to see the 70th week a certain way, which we will be looking at in a few weeks, you will see that the 70th week of Daniel has nothing to do with the seven-year tribulation. But even if you take that one scripture, first of all, it is an interpretation of the scripture, and it's the only one found in the whole Bible. And the only other way you can come up with seven years is to add two different three-and-a-half-year periods in the book of Revelation, which is quite unfair, seeing how there are three places where the book of Revelation mentions a period of three-and-a-half years. And if you are going to be consistent, you have to add all three together and come up with ten-and-a-half years. And those are the only two places they come up with in the Bible. And we are looking at Matthew 24, and here is one of the incredible things to me. Matthew 24, Jesus is answering the disciples' question, What shall be the sign of your coming, the end of the age, and the end of the world? And he never even mentions a seven-year tribulation, and he never mentions a secret rapture before it. In fact, what he does mention, as we will see today, that it is after the tribulation of those days that the rapture takes place. I can't go back and cover all the reasons this morning why I do not believe in that seven-year tribulation period with a rapture at the beginning. I believe in a three and a half year tribulation, which Daniel and Revelation clearly spell out and Matthew refers to that period of time, but doesn't give the years to it. And that tribulation period is the last three and a half years of this world as we know it. And during that time, the church will be here at which time they will be raptured out and then the millennium will begin. That is things that we've covered. But right now we are covering the signs of the time. We are covering the signs of the time. I shared with you that there are three clear biblical signs that we are in the last days that we should be aware of and take note of so that we are not shocked or surprised as things begin to take place. I gave you Daniel 12, 4, which talks about at the end, the book of Daniel is sealed to the end. And at that time, men will run to and fro on the earth and knowledge will increase. The other one I gave you was the fact that Israel would be restored as a nation. And I gave you scriptures for all of those. And we have already seen that men could not run to and fro through the earth until there was the jet airplane was invented. And knowledge did not significantly increase until the jet age. And frankly, Israel was not a nation and gathered until the same time. All three of those events came together at the end of the 40s and the beginning of the 50s. All three of them literally happened coinciding one with the other. Now, I want to mention one other thing that I think is extremely important before we move into new material today, and that is this. These first three signs, the sign of the men running to and fro on the earth, the fact that there will be tremendous increase in knowledge, and the fact 
that the scripture says Israel would be restored as a nation. Those are three very distinct statements in the word of God. Those all did not necessarily have to take place at the very end of time. Those warnings were signs that the end was upon us and that we were moving into the season of the last days. But there is a fourth sign that I did not mention until now, and that is this. In the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, it says, I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. First of all, there's a presupposition in that verse that you have to recognize, that first of all, in that verse, it is assuming that Israel had possession of the city of Jerusalem, and it was clearly lost at a point. You cannot have a distinctive three and a half year block of time where the Gentiles rule over Jerusalem any time before 1948. Do you know why? The Gentiles had been ruling over Jerusalem for 1900 years. So how are you going to separate and isolate that three and a half year period? It clearly says that the Gentiles will tread down underfoot the city of Jerusalem for three and a half years. What that supposes is that Jesus was clearly indicating Israel would be given back, which there are many verses that says that Israel will be gathered again, that Israel will be in possession of the city of Jerusalem, and then they're going to lose it. And when they lose it, they will lose it for a period of three and a half years. And that three and a half years is the mark of the beginning of the tribulation period. You have to understand that the prophet Muhammad, loosely called, made the statement that Israel would never be regathered again. Every day they exist, every day the nation of Israel exists, it is proof positive that Muhammad is a false prophet. The Islamic nations must destroy Israel. I have laying in my office desk, I have a report from 1996 presented to the United States Senate and Congress by a task force that studied the mindset of the Islamic believers in the Middle East. And here's what was presented to our senators and our congressmen. I have a word-for-word -word document revealing what was said and what was presented to them. And that statement was that the Islamic Muslim religion of the Middle East is convinced that to destroy Israel would cost them half their population. Because Israel is the third most military power on the face of the earth. They are a superpower with weapons that they openly declare the West doesn't even know they have. And furthermore, they are literally armed to the teeth with nuclear arms and rockets and weapons. And so the Islamic nations realize that if they attack Israel, Israel will go on a offensive with nuclear weapons, which incidentally they threatened to do not too long ago, and they're not afraid to use them. And every, every Islamic nation in the entire region there understands Israel will use nuclear weapons, and they will use them if they're pushed into a corner quickly and efficiently. And they are powerful nuclear weapons. This task force made the conclusion, and told this to our senators and our congressmen, that the Islamic nations and the Islamic mindset is such that they are willing to lose half of their entire population to eliminate the existence of Israel because it'll be worth it. There's 1.5 billion Muslims in the world today. About a billion of them live in the Middle East. And they are willing to suffer the loss of 500 million Muslims to eliminate a nation of 5 million. Why? Because their existence is proof positive that Islam is based on a false prophet. They must get rid of him. There is coming a moment in our future history, and I believe it is becoming very near, where there will be a day when Israel will once again lose the land of Israel called Jerusalem. And Jerusalem will be trodden underfoot for 42 months. And when that event takes place, we have a 42-month period to the coming of the Lord. And people say, well, we don't know the day nor the hour. How is that possible? Well, the Bible did not say we don't know the day, the hour, the week, the month, the year, or anything close to it. 
The Bible said we do not know the day or the hour. Furthermore, it's very logical. There are 24 hours and two days on the face of the earth all the time. Which day, which hour? Furthermore, the Bible makes it clear there are signs that we are to be watching for that we will know, and we'll see it in Scripture this morning, it is near even at the door. So we want to look at what those Scriptures say. Clearly, this time of trouble, according to Jeremiah 30, chapter 30, verses 6 through 8, says it's called Jacob's trouble. I think it's imperative to make note, it's called Jacob's trouble, and you'll see why it's Jacob's trouble. We have looked at the fact that Matthew 24 speaks of disasters in the world. Jesus gives a second sign, there will be deserters in the church. And after that, there will be a dictator in the Middle East, and that's what we are on now. And I would like to go back to Matthew 24, and I would like to read that section one more time for the purpose of everybody who wasn't here that we get on the same page scripturally. Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is in the housetops not come down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray your flight may not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. We've already covered all this. For then there shall be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. That is a very clear indication of what he is talking about. He is not talking about 70 AD. In 70 AD, one million Israelites died at the hands of Titus, General Titus of the Roman Empire, as he attacked the city of Jerusalem. One million. Hitler killed six million, and 56 million died in the Holocaust. Mao and Stalin killed 30 million people each. I have in my office a book that talks about a tyrant in China who lived centuries ago who sat down on a pricker in a certain province of China. And when he did, this emperor became so angry, he commanded that everyone in that province be killed and the province burned to the ground, which they did. And there were 30 million Chinese killed in that attack. Literally, Jerusalem in 70 AD is not the greatest calamity that has ever taken place. And Jesus said that it has not been since the beginning of the world until that time, no, nor shall it ever be. Whatever he was talking about happening here is going to be so catastrophic, it has never happened before and it will never happen again afterwards. That is not a description of 70 AD. And then he goes on, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. There's a lot of question about what that means. I'm not here to try to get into that today. We may discuss it if we get into the book of Daniel in some months. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Why does he say that if they're not even here? That's an obvious reflection to the fact that you are going to need to know this. Be aware that I've told you beforehand, because when the day comes, you're going to need to understand what's happening. He goes on, he says, therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. If we're not even here, these statements are idiotic. They don't make any sense. Of course, what Walvoord and Hal Lindsey and Schofield and all these men do, and, and I am not speaking disparagingly of them, what they do is they just say, oh, he's talking to the Jews. Well, we've already proved that's false too. He's talking to his disciples, and he is telling them what to look for. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Let's read on a couple more verses Starting verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give her light. I will pick that up later because that's part of the next point. One of the things that we have to realize is that tribulation and trouble has always accompanied the Christian faith. It is said that 50 million Christians died in the crusades of the dark ages. Great tribulation is what this is called. Not just tribulation, but the great tribulation in Revelation chapter 7, 14. And this great tribulation is clearly a short, climactic conclusion to the conflict of the ages. 
The book of Genesis begins after the fall of man with a conflict between two brothers, two themes, the flesh and the spirit, two different religious systems, one based by man's opinion, one based on God's. And the Bible is a record of the conflict of the ages that goes straight from Cain and Abel all the way to the last day between Antichrist and Jesus Christ. There are two men that will be meeting at the last day, Antichrist in place of Christ, a man, some man, and we'll see he's a man scripturally, and some man is going to face the man, Christ Jesus The conflict of the ages is going to conclude at the battle of Armageddon and it will be all over. And the conflict of the ages is what's going to bring about the final three and a half years of tremendous difficulty. The Bible says that during this time there's going to be martyrs. Jesus said in Revelation 7.14, the angel said to John, Sir, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus said more about this three and a half year sign than all the other signs listed in Matthew 24. And we need to very carefully look at what he's talking about in a lot of scriptures concerning who this beast is, what's causing this sign, what is causing this tribulation. He begins by mentioning the abomination that causes desolation. You can read that in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27, Daniel eleven thirty one, and Daniel 12, 11. You can read about this abomination of desolation, and it's very important to make this note. I've already said this, but I need to say it today for consistency's sake. The Bible clearly states that the abomination of desolation is when the enemy takes away the daily. If you look in all your Bibles, the word sacrifices, the daily sacrifice, the word sacrifice is in italics, and it is not in the original text. It has been added by translators that were influenced by different forces. The Bible simply says that you will know the abomination of desolation has taken place when they take away the daily in the area of the temple. In Israel, the daily is clearly the time of prayer every morning and every evening where the Jews meet at the wailing wall and they begin praying and they were not allowed to pray at that wall until they conquered Jerusalem and took it back in 1967. And when the soldiers came to that wall in 1967, having conquered the city and driven back the enemy that had attacked them, well, they actually was a preemptive attack in 67, they took that land, the soldiers, these these hardened military soldiers who had just gone through war, began to just weep and sob as they were able to pray at the Wailing Wall. And quite frankly, I have prayed at that wall and had an unusual encounter with the presence of the Lord. And he promises in the scripture that whoever prays to that wall will have such an encounter. And I was skeptical as all get out. And then as we were getting ready to go into the area by the wall and put our hands on the wall to pray, the man that was leading our tour read the scriptures about it. And we wrote down certain prayers that we really wanted God to do for us. And I wrote my little prayers down. And then I realized that God has promised whoever prays toward this wall, he's going to answer. And I took my little prayer, prayers, a whole list of things that I had in my heart, the deepest desires of my heart. And I went up to that wall and I put them in a little crack in that wall. And I put my hands on the wall and no sooner did I touch the wall than I was sobbing and weeping in the presence of the Lord, meeting the Lord in an unusual way because there's an anointing at that place. And those soldiers were just weeping and crying because it had been the first time in centuries that they were allowed to pray at that wall. But there's coming a day very very soon when the daily prayer in Jerusalem will be stopped and you will know that the abomination of desolation has taken place and the three and a half years has begun and Israel has lost the rights to the holy city. Hi, my name's Pastor Tim Tyler, and I want to answer the question, what must I do to be saved? Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So what does that mean? To believe in your heart is essential and the first order. What are we believing? That God raised Jesus from the dead. Well, why did Jesus die? Jesus died on the cross for my sins and your sins, the sins of the world. God's wrath was poured out upon Jesus for our sin and judgment was met at the cross so that you and I would not be judged. That's the grace of God. So we believe Jesus died for our sins and was buried. He rose from the dead, proving that God justified our sins through Christ. And now Jesus lives forevermore to give us that eternal life. Once believing that in our heart, we therefore must confess it with our mouths. The Bible says that when our heart is full or believes something, we speak it, we confess it. So it's more than just a belief system, it is a life. And so we must confess that Jesus is the Lord of our life and we have repented and submitted to his authority. That's what salvation is. So I'd like to walk with you through this prayer. Let's take it one step at a time. Let's believe first in our heart, number one, Jesus died for my sins. Secondly, confess we are a sinner. Lord, forgive us of our sins. We believe you died for them and we repent. Then, knowing this, we ask God to put his Holy Spirit within us. Now that your blood has cleansed me from sin, let your spirit birth new life in me, that I may be born again, born from above by the Spirit of God. I now give my life to you, Lord, and promise to live according to your ways and dictates that I may obey Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So I surrender my life to you to follow you all the days of my life. In this confession and belief, we will now commit our lives to Christ to obey and follow him. That is what secures salvation. And now it will manifest and live out in your life. I would encourage you to read and study the Word of God and pray daily to the Holy Spirit's power in your life. If you will follow these and get into a local church where you can be baptized to publicly declare your faith in Jesus Christ, this will help secure who you are as a child of God. God bless you.